Josh Hasten here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, the 23rd of December, 2019, the 25th of Kislev 5780. And you know what that means, Benjamin Breski? That means it's Hanukkah. That's right, folks. Today is the first day of Hanukkah. Last night we lit one candle, the glorious eight-day festival celebrating our freedom from tyranny, celebrating our freedom and our victory against the Hellenization, uh, the attempted Hellenization of the Jews. The Maccabees, the few against the many, so many different messages of the holiday of Hanukkah. It's beautiful. If you have not been to Israel for Hanukkah, this is one of the, the, there are many times you should come to Israel during the year, but this is one of the special times where you walk the streets of places like Jerusalem, where I am here this morning, and see everyone out lighting their Hanukkiot, Hanukkiot in the windows throughout the streets, throughout the country. So many special activities taking place. A lot of the school kids have off this week, and it's just one big Happy party, as it is always here in the state of Israel. In just a second, we're going to speak to Eugene Kantorovich from the Kohelet Policy Forum to talk about probably the top news story here, and I'll read it from the Jerusalem Post, the ICC to investigate Israel for so-called war crimes in Gaza and Judea and Samaria. We're basically, basically what they're saying here is that Jews living in Judea is a war crime. I mean, there's a lot of details. They're also accusing Israel of carrying out, potentially carrying out crimes during the defensive war against the Hamas terrorists in 2014. And, um, but I mean, this is really the, the top story here. So, you know, why don't we get right to it? Let's go to the phone. Eugene Kantorovich from the Kohelet Policy Forum. Eugene, one of the main stories this week out of Israel is the ICC and uh, decision to investigate Israel for so-called war crimes in Gaza and Judea and Samaria, what they call the West Bank. What is the significance of the ICC ruling? Is this just another BDS-like ruling against Israel, or is this more significant, in your opinion? The International Criminal Court is another b- completely biased international institution that has hostility to Israel baked into its DNA. The actual founding treaty of the, uh, of the court, called the Rome Statute, contained one specific provision specifically put in, and different from any previous international law, to try to criminalize Jews living in Judea and Samaria, a unique provision designed for Israel. That's actually why Israel didn't join the court, and that's also one of the reasons the U.S. didn't join the court. Since then, it has shown that it is really just an adjunct of the United Nations uh, automatic majority against Israel, fighting UN resolutions as if they were legal facts. Now, uh, so this is not a legal body, it's a political body. It's biased against Israel's manifest and everything. But at the same time, it can create diplomatic headaches because it does exercise some criminal powers and it can purport to issue arrest warrants against uh, Israeli officials for letting Jews live in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria. So it's a diplomatic headache. It's not a. It's not the war, it's not the biggest crisis, but it is definitely uh, a problem that needs to be dealt with. So you're saying that technically, as a result of this uh, decision, if an Israeli official, diplomat, somebody, I guess, with connections perhaps to Judea and Samaria, would travel abroad, the ICC could issue an arrest warrant, which a country could then act on. Potentially, they could issue arrest warrants. That would be many years down the road, uh, but that is one of the things they could do. Now, those arrest warrants, you know, would only really be uh, an issue in member ICC member states, which is about half the countries in the world. Uh, but that includes most European, uh, all European countries. Now, it's unlikely that European countries would necessarily arrest uh, an Israeli leader because of such an Ill- illegitimate investigation. But you know, it's it's a concern. But I have to say there's a silver lining to this, to this, to what the ICC has done. Because for a long time, the ICC had been used by parts of the Israeli establishment as, uh, as a kind of a bogeyman to try to keep the government, the right-wing government, from allowing people to build in Yesha and from enforcing the law in Yesha. So the uh, legal officials would tell uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you can't knock down illegal European-funded settlements in Khan al-Omar or other places where Palestinians are trying to create uh, create facts on the ground 
even though the Supreme Court has ordered you to, because maybe that will trigger an ICC investigation. You can't let Jews build here or there or exercise uh, sovereignty in the Jordan Valley because all of these things were said to uh, be triggers for an ICC investigation. As a result, Prime Minister Netanyahu did none of those things, and nonetheless, the ICC investigation is coming anyway. So at least now that the uh, bogeyman is out of the closet, not, you know, came from out, un, under the bed, and uh, we see there's, not, you know, there's no technical legal thing that we can do to prevent this investigation, because it's a political investigation, not a legal one. So now at least Israel can conduct and implement these policies without any um, concern for the ICC. So are you on a scale, let's say on a scale of 1 to 10, I mean, how worried are you? I understand everything that you said in terms of what Israel now perhaps can do and the fact that this is a political body, but how, how concerned are you? I mean, is this front page news? Is this something we have to seriously keep our eyes on for the days, weeks, and months ahead? No, nothing's going to happen in the days and uh, in weeks and months. Uh, but you know, certainly, it's, it's like, it, it, basically, the Palestinians have laid diplomatic minds. That, you know, they're, they're not like missiles aimed straight at you, but they might hit you uh, nonetheless. Uh, so it's, it's important to avoid them. But it's important also to know the reason why we're at the ICC, because the Palestinians took us there against the Oslo Accords. And we need to, you know, draw the conclusions about the validity of the Palestinian Authority, the validity of the Oslo Accords. Eugene Kantorovich, head of international, the International Law Department at the Kohat Policy Forum, and let me say, one of, one of the top, I would say, minds today in our generation on international law. And it's great to have you uh, on the show today. I appreciate your insight. And uh, let's talk again as this case perhaps moves forward. We'll see what, uh, what happens down the road. I appreciate it. Have a great day and Hanukkah Sameach. Great talking to you, Joe. We're going to take a short break. Be right back here. This is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. We're coming back with all the news from Israel. Stay tuned. Do not go anywhere as we celebrate Hanukkah here in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish people. Don't go anywhere. Hey everybody, this is Yishai Fleischer, and like you, I love Hanukkah. I love Hanukkah, it's the festival of lights, so let's light it up, let's light up this world, and one of the only stations that you can get the light of Israel with is the Land of Israel Network. It's going to give you a sense of what's going on here, what's really happening in the land, wherever you are, you're going to be connected, you're going to be part of it. So check out the Yishai Fleischer show on the Land of Israel Network and all the other great shows. So let's be together, let's light it up, let's light that Chanukiah wherever we are and be part of a great light together. And we are back. Josh Hasten here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com for the 23rd of December, 2019. The 25th of Kislev, the first day of Hanukkah. I hope you're enjoying Hanukkah for those who are celebrating all over the world. I just got back from a few days in New York City where it was freezing cold and raining most of the time. And um, and I had, no, I had a good time there in New York, but of course, always great to come back home to the Land of Israel, even though I my flight was delayed by 17 hours it was completely insane, but I'm not going to waste uh, airtime here to talk about that experience. I could probably do a whole show on my experience there uh, flying out of Newark and being delayed for 17 hours. It was a close call, but I made it back f before Shabbat, thank God. But speaking of the United States, um, Bernie Sanders and the Democrats had their sixth Democratic presidential debate at Loyola Marymount in L.A. on this uh, on Thursday, this past Thursday. And Bernie Sanders went off on Prime Minister Netanyahu, calling him a racist regarding, as reported by the Jerusalem Post, regarding U.S. foreign policy. He said it's not just being pro-Israel. We must be pro-Palestinian as well. This is the Jewish Bernie Sanders saying, adding that right now Israel is under the leadership of Netanyahu, who has recently been indicted for bribery, who, in my view, is a racist. He called to address the terrible crisis in Gaza, where 60 to 70 percent of the young people are unemployed, adding that his foreign policy would promote human rights and democracy. Now, what is he really saying here? He's actually saying, let's support Hamas. Let's strengthen Hamas because they're the ones who control Gaza. That's really what he's saying. He's not saying it openly, but he is saying 
let's support, let's be pro-Palestinian. What does that mean, be pro-Palestinian authority? Just open up the television or pick up a textbook and see how the Palestinian authority, we'll talk about it here in a minute, is spewing hatred, how Hamas is spewing hatred. Yet he wants to, uh, you know, I don't, first of all, I don't understand this. Israel sends tons and tons of trucks into Gaza each and every day, which I don't understand, but that, you know, that is Israeli policy. So he wants to add to that. I mean, he really wants to strengthen Hamas. That's the bottom line. That is what Bernie, a Bernie Sanders presidency would be all about. It would be, in his view, what he calls pro-Palestinian, which actually, which actually means pro-Hamas. He would strengthen that terror organization. So if you're out there and you're a Democrat, and plenty of Jews are Democrats, that we know, um, and then even if you're not Jewish and that's the party you support, I, I would say that I would uh, stay away from, from Bernie Sanders. It doesn't matter if he's Jewish or Christian or whatever he is, but his policies are just uh, just a little bit nuts, uh, or not, or a whole lot nuts. So uh, at the same time, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden said that President Trump is no longer being an honest broker in Israel. Good. <laughs> an honest broker, you have the side of, of good and everything wonderful and... Um, humane and then you have the side of evil which is the plo or the palestinian authority which promotes terror and violence against jews israelis tourists christians uh here in israel and uh, throughout uh, their history all over the world and um you know there's what is this honest broker nonsense it, it is a, it is black and white you have good and you have evil i'm not talking about er, every single arab in the street i'm i'm talking about the leadership within the Palestinian Authority, is is evil. So, yeah, President Trump has done great by Israel, and he's taking the side of good. So why does Joe Biden say that uh, he has a problem with uh, Trump being not being an honest broker? Biden went on to, keep, uh, to continue to promote a so-called two-state solution. So, you know, he is still stuck in this Oslo mentality. Uh, Biden is stuck in the failed policies over the last 25 years, which just led to the increase in rocket fire and terror attacks and horrible things, the so-called Second Intifada or Oslo War. So they want to go back down that path again. Um, does uh, does Joe Biden, I think he's pretty much leading, if I'm not mistaken. I, mean, I don't know about the Michael Bloomberg effect. Or, I haven't really been following so much. Even even over there in the States, I I watched more Sports Center than I did the news and the Trump impeachment or whatnot. I thought Sports Center was more interesting but these are these are the future leaders of of that party. So think twice uh, when you vote. Uh, not only if you're a Democrat, you vote in the primaries, but overall when you're voting, and if Israel is a concern for you, again, if it's not on your uh, on your plate, I still would vote for Trump because if you care about the economy, then you got to vote for Trump. But nevertheless, um, you have to take all this into consideration. If Israel is a priority, uh, Mike Pompeo slams. The Democrats and their fixation on communities in Judea and Samaria. This was from a few days ago, but I had to catch up on a whole week of newspapers. So this is something uh, this is something I missed. Calling their arguments foolish, as reported by the Jerusalem Post, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo sent a harsh letter last week to 106 Democratic members of House that while uh, saying that while they are quote free to fixate on settlements as a barrier to peace, they are simply wrong. Secretary of State sent the letter to Michigan Congressman Andy Levin, who was behind a letter sent to Pompeo last month in which 106 representatives denounced the Trump administration for softening its position on the legality of communities in Judea and Samaria. In it, uh, Pompeo slammed the Obama administration's position on Israel. So listen, what you have here is you have this Andy Levin, a Jewish uh, congressman from Michigan, who, by the way, was just in Israel on a J Street trip and was tweeting lies about Israel fed to him by J Street while he was here in regard to Susia and the illegal Arab uh, village of Susia. We could do a whole show just on, on, that, on that situation down there in the southern Hebron Hills. But Andy Levin, he was leading, this Jewish congressman was leading the charge against the Trump administration's recognition that communities in Judea and Samaria are not illegal. So Mike Pompeo uh, struck back calling them foolish, saying that uh, the State Department here under this administration made the decision that it recognized, rather, that communities in Judea and Samaria are not illegal under international law. This is amazing. He called the Obama administration 
and their support or their when they abstained on UN Security Council Resolution 2334, he called that a betrayal, a betrayal of Israel. That was, if you remember, that was in December of 2016 when a resolution was passed talking about how communities in Judea and Samaria are illegal. If you remember, all the members of, of the different nations got up and applauded when that resolution was passed because the Obama administration decided to abstain. He says, Pompeo says that the, that the administration betrayed Israel. And therefore, this is one of the reasons why Pompeo, just several weeks ago, I believe it was, came out with this uh, unbelievable statement indicating that communities in Judea and Samaria are not illegal, regardless of how you, how you feel about them, okay? He is saying, I don't care what you think, and if you want to be obsessed with these communities, that's your business. But don't say they're illegal, all right? And they are not illegal. And he consulted with international. We, if we had Eugene Kontrovich back on the show, we could talk about this as well, how communities in Judea and Samaria are, in, in fact, legal. So thank you to, to the, once again, thank you to the Trump administration and Pompeo for putting these ill-advised or, you know, I say ill-advised because a lot of them are getting their information from J Street, as I said, these Congress people who, no matter what, no matter what, are coming out against the communities, the Jewish communities of Yudav Shermon, Judea, and Samaria. Uh, turning to other news here, um, Israeli activist and longtime Knesset member Gula Cohen has passed away. This woman was a warrior, okay? She was a member of Knesset. She was in the uh, pre-state uh, underground movements, the Irgun and the Lehi. She was arrested by the British in 1946, escaped prison, elected to Knesset, and continued uh, and advocated against territorial withdrawal, campaigning against the Oslo Accords. This was reported by JNS, this uh, article on Gula Cohen, and the 2005 uh, pullout from Gaza. And she obviously was right on all of those fronts. She left the Likud to form a, a separate party called Tehia in 2003 because Likud, she felt, wasn't uh, strong enough against territorial concessions. Israel Prize Laureate. She's also the mother of the Kud minister, Tzachi Negmi, but she's just a real warrior for the Jewish people, always against concessions, and she was, uh, she was right. I mean, we got nothing from concessions. We got nothing from talks of two-state solutions. Uh, she saw what the future would uh, bring, and that's why she was so much against the 2005 pullout from Gaza and the Oslo Accords, and of course... Now you have uh, Jewish Congress, Congressman uh, Levin from, uh, from Michigan, and you have Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, everyone, everyone else who still wants to go down that path of uh, suicidal concessions to the Palestinian Authority. But uh, may she rest in peace, Gula Cohen, true warrior of Israel. The House Committee, that was a JNS report, by the way. I think I said that, but in, just in case, you've got to give credit where credit is due. House Committee passes Peace and Tolerance in Palestinian Education Act. The House Foreign Affairs Committee, reported by the J Post, unanimously passed the Peace and Tolerance in PA Education Act this past week. The bill requires the Secretary of State to submit annual reports reviewing the educational materials used by the Palestinian Authority and UNRWA. And what are those uh, materials? Uh, what are they all about? They continue to be tools of incitement against Israel, educating the next generation of Arab children to hate the state of Israel. Nothing new there. For example, an 11th grade book describing the 1972 Munich massacre as a, quote, strike at Zionist interests abroad. A 7th grade social studies text claiming that Zionists burned down Al-Aqsa Mosque in 1969, even though an Australian tourist belonging to a fundamentalist sect, was responsible for starting that fire. But anyway, this uh, new legislation calls on the uh, relevant authorities to investigate these books, investigate the texts, and then decide whether or not they want to financially support the education coming out of the Palestinian Authority. And I think that the work done here by the Monitoring Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance in School Education, called Impact SE, um, has done their homework and has proven that the PA, even if they have new textbooks, and UNRWA continue to incite against Israel and the Jewish people. So definitely they should not be funded. Um, 
Speaking of terror organizations, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ. By the way, that's a Sunni organization, by the way. I thought that PIJ, originally I thought they were Shia. They are Sunni, so they have a lot in common with Hamas. They've agreed to stand together in the next fight with Israel. If you recall, in the last round of violence, PIJ took the lead while Hamas sat back and watched. But don't worry, next time around, God forbid, but it's certainly, uh, it's pretty much inevitable the next time they start firing rockets in bulk at Israel, they have decided that they're going to stand together shoulder to shoulder. Um, It's always like that, folks. You know, Hamas and the Palestinian Authority perhaps don't like each other, but when it comes to trying to murder Israeli women and children, forced to run to bomb shelters, with that they can always agree on. And here's just another example. Overlooking their differences in philosophies, PIJ and Hamas deciding when it comes to Israel, they're going to stand side by side. A little bit of negative news here, according to a report by uh, Tova Lazarov in the J-Post, construction in Judea and Samaria is at its lowest point since U.S. President Donald Trump took office in 2017, dropping by a third, 34% in the first three quarters of this year as compared to the same period last year, according to the Central Bureau of Statistics. I'm not going to get into all the numbers here, but this is a a negative report indicating that housing uh, starts are down. Now, why is this happening when the Trump administration is so pro-Israel, pro-Israel according to the Yesha Council and their head, Yigal Dil, uh, Dilmoni, he says that the drop um, in starts is due to the last few years of the Obama administration. He says it's not because of Trump. He's saying that we're still talking about uh, permits which were not issued, a lack of permits all the way back from, from the Obama administration. He's saying that As a result of uh, what's going on now in terms of the attitude towards Israel in the current administration, now is the time to build. We need to plan for the future under Trump, and this should be the time. Unfortunately, we don't have a government right now, so I don't know how much planning can actually take place, but he believes that um, he's saying now we're paying for the freeze from before and we need to not uh, come to that same position in the future Hence, we need to start focusing on building in Judea and Samaria, and I agree with him 100%. Just uh, to finish the show today, I always like to end on some very positive news. Israel always contributing to the world in so many different arenas, technology, medicine, sports, whatever it is. Hadassah, Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem has a breakthrough reported here by Mayan Hoffman. In the J-Post, a breakthrough method to identify cancer. Doctors at Hadassah University Medical Center have developed what they call a breakthrough new method to identify thyroid cancer at 94% accuracy. The study was published in a, uh, in a journal, the Journal of Cancer Epidemiology, if I'm saying that correctly, Biomarkers and Prevention. And I'm not a medical person, so I don't understand all the details here. But again, the bottom line is Israeli doctors being able to extremely accurately uh, being able to identify uh, thyroid cancer and they're doing more tests here and the and the group is looking for more funding to increase their samples and continue to better the world in which we live in and that happens and we can find these stories daily coming out of Israel even with all the haters out there and the BDSers and the ICCs and everyone else trying to destroy us we continue to send medical teams all over the world and save lives and do so much to contribute to humanity. And that's going to do it for today's show. My name is Josh Haston. This is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com as we celebrate Hanukkah throughout the world and here in Israel. Big shout out to Benjamin Bresky for the work he does getting these shows together and Tabitha Epstein as well. It is Monday, the 23rd of December, the 25th of Kisa, first day of Hanukkah, 5780. Get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com, on Facebook, Joshua Haston, or my page, Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and Journalism, on Twitter at Josh Haston, and now on Instagram as well. Most importantly, between now and when we talk again, please God, next Monday, which will still be Hanukkah, will be the last day of Hanukkah. Everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Have a wonderful Hanukkah from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. During the darkest time of the year, we light the Hanukkah candles to remember that the truth and values we brought to the world at Mount Sinai will endure forever. And that every person who loves Israel and stands with Israel is a modern day Maccabee. In 
just as God performed magnificent miracles before the eyes of the world through the Maccabees in those days, God is performing even greater miracles through the Maccabees at this time. Because here in the land of Israel, we never forget that just one candle can illuminate the entire world. Happy Hanukkah from the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.